Good evening. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome Nicholas Hirsch. Uh, it's an extra source of pleasure since uh, Nicholas teaches here at the AA, and it's always good to uh, introduce AA tutors uh, up here. Um, Nicholas's work, I think, combines in a very interesting way uh, the worlds of architectural practice, criticism, theory, and teaching. In a way, it's, uh, it's a genuine form of practice because there's a very close link between uh, what he writes and uh, how he practices. Uh, one of the key topics of uh, his preoccupations is really the relationship between uh, permanence or issues of permanence and temporality. Uh, he has touched on this in, in one text, uh, which is primarily in German, but exists also partly in English, called Stable and Unstable Conditions, which was published a couple of years ago uh, in Frankfurt. And uh, this relationship between permanence and temporality can obviously be explored at a variety of different scales, at times dealing with questions of the city and the urban landscape, uh, which he has done through such projects as Monument Track 17 in Berlin and a master plan for a disused railway area in Munich, but also in the more recent project, the more recently completed project for the synagogue in Dresden that uh, we are now showing in the exhibition upstairs where, for example, on the inside, this issue of the, of the temporal is developed through the mesh screens that exist on the inside of the building, allowing for certain levels of, of uh, flexibility and change uh, to occur. He has also gone on to work on the temporal conditions of walls, of sound structures, uh, and performances, and uh, has been fortunate to receive a number of awards, most recently the BDA Prize uh, in 1998 in Berlin, and the 1822 Art Prize and the German Critics Award in 2001. Uh, please welcome Nicholas Hirsch. This evening, uh, thanks for the, for the introduction, Moisen. Uh, I want to limit myself in a way to uh, five, only five projects. They are quite different in scale and context. This is uh, a monument, an urban master plan, a synagogue, a temporary exhibition structure, and a theater. What they share is probably a certain interest for temporal phenomena and um, probably uh, this approach is reflected on, a, on both programmatic and material level. Assuming that architecture is about spatial organization and determination, the notion of time raises obviously some questions. How is a discipline that is traditionally described as a paradigm of predetermination, how is this discipline affected by economical and cultural contexts that are increasingly unpredictable? Has time changed the planning process in general and the role of the architect in specific? And last uh, but not least, uh, how can we describe the relationship between temporal phenomena and material? The notion of time is certainly quite relevant for monuments and things that have to do with memory in general. Memory needs supports like written or spoken words, rituals, monuments. Yet the problem is that the same Nemo technique that guarantee remembrance harbor somehow potential oblivion so that 
the uh, pretension of permanence is affected by time. So in this sense, um, the supports of memory are not reliable. They can assume a rigidified form devoid of any content. They become arbitrary and exchangeable. It is revealing in this context to take a look at a very common mnemotechnique mentioned by Heidegger in Being and Time, the handkerchief, or um, in, in a clear way, the knot in the handkerchief. This knot is linked to the idea of an event which one fears to forget. As pure sign, it may fulfill an endless number of mnemonic tasks, yet which of these is the one relevant at the moment? Confusion is always possible, we all know these moments. Thus it not only happens that the knot can only be understood by initiates, but also that the original sign needs further signs, like another knot, in order to be understood. So in this sense there's always a sort of problem with monuments to get somehow um, sort of ob obtrusiveness of a disposable object. One way to counter the tendency of monuments to become self-sufficient, maybe their relation to a site. While aut autonomous sites accelerate the association of sign and signified, one could mention here, just as an example, the problem of the um, central Holocaust memorial by Peter Eisenman in the center of Berlin. The reference to a site um, has the possibility of structural links of a site-specific work that um, materially connects uh, with the location. The train station Berlin Grunewald is such a site you see it here, in a, it's a quite uh, typical situation in Berlin, a tunnel, and then you have some stairs to the tracks. So this station is, is such a site, but it is also a quite ordinary area. It is marked by a certain banality. There aren't many, many signs indicating that this place is the place where the deportation of the Jews from Berlin began in October 19. 41. As back then, the track 17 is still part of a larger context of parallel and parallel temporal and spatial uses. So nearby to or next to the track 17, there are other tracks with uh, commuters, fast trains are, are, are inside. And right next, on the other side of track 17, is a train used for housing purposes, purposes with some very visible signs like antennas and things like that. So it's a very uh, usual situation, which seems to be quite uh, strange to the idea of a monument. And right next, on the other side of track 17, is a uh, sort of car train uh, check-in where every day uh, hundreds of people are waiting to, to get transported with their cars. So track 17 is part of um, a very parallel logic of things. So it's not something autonomous, but one linear element among others. One ordinary site within a context of parallel transitory objects. The ordinariness of the site leads us to a perception which Walter Benjamin saw as characteristic of architecture in general. I quote, as regards architecture, habit determines to a large extent even optical reception. The latter, too, occurs much less through rapt attention than by noticing the object in an, in an incidental way. 
So in this sense, we were quite interested to uh, to um, develop, develop a sort of perception that takes into account uh, certain certain fleetingness, sort of, sort of transitory uh, character of the station. So in this sense, um, it was quite important somehow for us to uh, to link these ideas to to a sort of process of progression and wo and walking in relation of a of a perception of of, of uh, the monument. So the the site track seventeen exists. It does not have to be invented. The intervention is reduced to a definition of a frame allowing the site to become visible and accessible. This frame consists, consists of a number, a large number of elements. You see here again track 17 and there's a sort of frame here on both sides of the track. It's a very that you see here, it's, it's a very flat and thin um, object. This frame consists of 186 elements according to the number of deportations originating in Berlin. Horizontal cast iron objects measuring approximately uh, uh, 140 to 310 centimeters serve as two platforms extending 132 meters. So in this sense, it was a quite important thing to create a sort of tour around uh, track 17, which as you see here is, has been largely unused after the war. So there was there is quite a specific situation in the sense that we find quite a lot of vegetation in the track itself. The elements do not seal the ground, rather they sit upon the given area. They are not closed. It's a, oh, it's upside down. So you should normally, you should turn your head a little bit. It's a, <laughs> It's a perforated um, system where the, uh, the ground remains visible. The logic of the elements follows the chronology of the deportations which are listed by date on a heading uh, line in a way up to the platform date of transport, number of deportees, destination. So that in this sense, there are no mimet mimetic uh, substitutes in the form of uh, images. It is more something like a very factual logic of data that you see here. So it's something like a uh, very uh, simple and basic schedule that um, starts from uh, beginning from late 1941 to uh, May 45. To guarantee a permanent inscription of the data into the site, the choice of material was of uh, particular importance. Uh, we chose a corrosion resistant cast iron, name is uh, GG30, which is a sort of cast iron with a very specific uh, graphite uh, inner structure. And um, because it was one of the main impacts was to guarantee a certain uh, dura durability and treatability. The elements um, were um, built in a, or the, the, uh, the whole process uh, started with a milled mold of aluminium. 
which was used as a positive for the sand cast of all the 186 elements. Inside this, here we see such a sand cast form. Inside this mold, the final relation of closure and openness with respect to the perforation was determined. So the, the, uh, the, the grid that you, these open uh, fields or perforations um, were developed in a way that the flow of the, of the, the cast iron um, was guaranteed because the, uh, the whole element has uh, quite big size, uh, which was a technological problem in the, in the beginning. The open grid was staggered in accordance with the flow line of the casting process. And for all the, you see here another image of the casting process. For all 186 elements, the writing, uh, this sort of headline, is in individually set in the same mold of aluminium with the support of a system, or sort of flexible system of, of frames. The, uh, in the development of the letters and numbers, uh, things like flank angles, uh, etc., were extremely important because also weather um, was, could be a problem if uh, you don't choose the right angles. Being conjoined at the Grunewald station, the particular data of transport form a line of writing similar to a schedule. So in this sense, this is the end product of the cast. So in this sense, the frame creates a definition of the site in a double sense. On the one hand, by a precise spatial limitation, on the other hand, by a temporal determination in terms of the durab durability of the material. One characteristic that you already saw is distinguishes track 17 from the other tracks of the station. In between the tracks, trees have grown. Following the logic of the site, a sort of forest has grown spontaneously in a linear manner covering half of the area of the track's length that had not been in use since the end of the war. In this area, occurred what uh, botanics call uh, successions, which, is, uh, which are temporal sequences of different vegetation um, processes. And these vegetation cycles indicate somehow temporal gaps or in a general manner temporality itself. In an initial phase, small growing plants like herbs and grasses took hold of the ground as plant pioneers, which were followed by a dense forest of birches growing on the crushed, crushed stone base between the tracks. This phase of vegetation remained steady until enough humus had developed to give rise to the present stock of beeches, oaks, and other sorts of trees. This self-organized process of succession will continue. It will spread to the tracks and grow within the frame of the 186 elements with perforations of the single cast elements as an open grid for transformations. The tracks may then be covered by a layer emerging in proportion to use and factual visits. The disturbance through visitors serves in this sense as a central parameter, parameter determining just how much grass will grow over the events. So partly, um, if only old photographs, but partly uh, the structure is sort of overgrown or it's, it's, it started to uh, develop a, a quite interesting image where some parts are 
extremely precise and, and rigid, other parts uh, seem to disappear with the time. So the aim was, in a way, to uh, develop a structural connection between memory and forgetting. The unstable status of memory moves to the center of the intervention of track 17. On one hand, the determination of the historical data. On the other hand, the indetermination of future time. The spatial definition of the site through a permanent frame and, on the other hand, the successive transformation through vegetation. The structures try to fix time. The processes mark, in a way, the irre irreversibility of time. These ideas of succession were, for, for us, quite interesting um, because we uh, had the possibility to expand uh, similar ideas in another project that was quite different in context and dimension. Which is um, an urban project for Munich, for a central railway area, a web of transport links and industries over 174 hectares. The shifting of cargo tracks and train lines and industrial areas to the urban periphery opens up um, quite important uh, possibility for Munich to for a sort of inner city growth. Here you see part of this railway area, small detail and quite dense structure above it or next to it. So the rail, as the railway tracks offer the possibility of an expansion of the city right in the center of the city instead of an extension to the periphery with all its, all its effects of urban sprawl, land ceiling, etc. This, uh, the, the city of Munich and the rail, German railway company launched this uh, competition. And somehow for us, it was in the beginning not, uh, it was certainly a serious project, a uh, serious competition, but we used it more as a sort of research, not, uh, not really respecting the uh, the quite specific brief we had and with uh, where it was more a problem how much uh, square meters we integrate into the area. So here we see the, the whole strip of nearly seven kilometers in Munich. And one possibility was certainly uh, to create a continuous vegetation, sort of band here, which, which respected or expanded, in a way, uh, existing vegetations in the railway area itself. So that was one main um, issue to uh, to guarantee this sort of uh, green band, which certainly creates something similar to other very long natural uh, green bands in Munich, but here with an obviously different character, more in a quite rough sense. So the the dimension of the area makes it that was one starting point for us, the dimension of the area makes it quite improbable that uh, we would have a realization in one step. It was, we started in the competition uh, 
sort of critique of a master plan thinking and we're trying to explore methods of planning that avoid a sort of determination of a closed and idealistic final status that mostly, as we thought, obstruct middle and long-term development. Therefore, it seemed to be necessary to develop an urban strategy that puts built and vegetal elements on a temporal basis and in a reciprocal relationship um, where both both characters, the built and the vegetal character, are in a close relationship. The instrument for this is a sort of pattern. This pattern is less a morphological structure than a, a frame that prefigures built and vegetal situations. For example, here, um, the, uh, an understanding of unbuilt areas waiting somehow for uh, um, an important uh, investor. These uh, unbuilt areas can be qualified by extensive self-sufficient vegetation and like the pioneer plants that we saw before. A similar strategy is used for built structures, sort of pioneer buildings, which in a, if I may translate it uh, literally, from German, which are flying buildings. It sounds a little bit stupid, but um, it's it's a legal um, it's it's a legal notion in, in German, which uh, flying buildings are buildings that are not um, fixed in the ground with uh, heavy foundations that uh, will be used for a quite short uh, lifespan which may be uh, buildings for sport or uh, leisure or just a uh, youth club, things like that. The urbanization will develop in a progressive way while insisting on a visible and qualitative structure in the first phase. You see a sort of gradients in a 90 degree angle to the uh, to this continuous green band and these uh, gradients are a sort of first and minimal frame or line to be exact also determining a maximum length of possible buildings in this direction the infrastructure such as secondary streets in the other axis so in this axis is an urban variable and is only specified according to specific programs. So in this sense, um, we were trying to uh, give sort of maximum uh, freedom for possible uh, developments like housing, like uh, investors and because um, from our point of view it was quite difficult in in the competition to really predetermine the future in this sense. The quality of the continuous open space between the city center and the periphery is the basis of the urban intervention. Its functions are quite heterogeneous. It is basically a sort of climatic corridor a space for leisure and on an urban level um, yes a space space for leisure on an urban level and on the level of the neighborhoods which are here and there and finally it uh, is a zone with specific botanic qualities because um, we were working with a an, an biologist who was extremely uh, interesting in this interest in this area because uh, you will find a lot of protected animals and plants etc in in these railway uh, areas so there are even sort of protected zones in this uh, green band 
The uh, densification of the build structure is developed according to existing intensities, such as train stations, underground stations, and main urban access in north-south direction. So this here is uh, the city center of Munich. This is towards uh, western periphery, and these circles indicate uh, sort of uh, density uh, points in the city. And starting from these points, the density is scaled down to uh, <coughs> from the center to to the periphery of of these circles. So it was a whole. Um, Research on, on existing densities and those densities um, given, given by the brief, which in some cases made sense and others not. We were fo focusing firstly on, on existing densities and infrastructural densities like uh, a tube and train station. So here is a tube station, for instance, here another one. And these are quite frequent with street, streets where it is, uh, was quite difficult to integrate housing. So it was uh, quite obvious that uh, it will be a very dense zone where we will find uh, sort of smaller high-rise buildings that you saw before in the perspective. these buildings. Starting from these points of the, where we have these uh, buildings which are mainly offices, the uh, densities is scaled down to middle densities with mixed use and very low densities for individual houses. So there is a sort of graduation uh, strategy which was Partly, um, well, we, we started somehow with a probably rom romantic idea of th there's a certain myth, myth perhaps about mixity in, in building program and we became aware of quite quickly about this problem that uh, mixity is not always the right solution and so there were, therefore we uh, started to develop the strategy of graduation where where we uh, started from these very dense zones that are also in a very purely capitalistic sense, very interesting for some people and not interesting for housing, also for reasons of, of uh, pollution, etc. And it was then uh, gradually uh, scaled down to the periphery. See that here again. So these are the most dense zones. This is sort of mixed zone with, uh, with a quite. There is a certain density, but middle density, as we called it, and this uh, is, uh, really a very low density of familiar housing. This is uh, an image showing connections of uh, vegetation systems. We have this sort of band here and connections to existing green structures in the city. And these vegetation areas um, have a similar logic of graduation starting from intensively used areas nearby public transport stations for leisure and sport. These intensive zones need also an intensive maintenance. And on the other side, nearby the, uh, the train station, as I told, before, told you before, there are, it's, uh, it's more about sort of uncontrolled uh, succession of vegetation. We find self-sufficient plants that are protected from direct use and function. So this is a, a quite uh, 
was for us a quite interesting uh, collaboration with this uh, biologist who was uh, extremely uh, um, clear about uh, his position to uh, that some areas have to be protected from human use and this is probably the most extreme uh, part of this uh, vegetational uh, vegetational uh, graduation so the third project i want to show is the synagogue of dresden which was completed in november thinking about a new synagogue in dresden leads in a Leads, uh, leads directly to a number of critical questions. Can we define a specific architecture of Jewish houses of worship? How is the relation between architectural parameters on one side and phenomena like identity and migration on the other side? And how does a building react to an urban context which is characterized by reconstruction of the past or past architecture. Reconstruction refers to destruction. In our case, we can speak of a double destruction, that of Gottfried Semper's synagogue, which you see here, like all the synagogues in the Third Reich, Germany, on uh, 19th uh, of November 1938. And the other destruction is that of the entire historical city on uh, 13th and 14th of February 1945. See here the destruction of the city. And some years after, in the beginning of the 50s, sort of tabula rasa. And this is still present in, in Dresden, this feeling of, of a void city, which there are a lot of prefab houses in, built in, in the 60s, 70s. But in fact, it's, a, it's really a city uh, that is, has an extreme low density. So these, destruction, th these destructions are historically linked, yet the architectural consequences couldn't be more different. Dresden tried to re reproduce its old town. This is probably the most prominent uh, example. It's the Frauenkirche, which uh, will be rebuilt with um, British support, because in fact it was where Allied bombers were destroying the city. And in such a way, um, Dresden is trying to reconstruct uh, the whole historical city. And this is probably uh, what, what we could call, very in an ironic way, a sort of master plan of Dresden. Uh, it's uh, Dresden as it has been. And I think 50% nearly is reconstructed of this historical center. Now the Frauenkirche will be completed in four years. And we were quite uh, interested in this, in this image in a way because uh, looking closer to these good old times, it, normally, uh, the synagogue of Gottfried Semper sh should be visible. But obviously, uh, this picture was taken uh, in the first years of, of the Third Reich, and the synagogue has al already disappeared. The synagogue was here. We couldn't find out if, if it, the picture was taken after destruction or a sort of early Photoshop technique. But the uh, emblematic reconstruction of, of the Frauenkirche um, 
is something like the sort of counterposition to the situation that we confronted. The Fraunkirche tries to establish sort of continuity between past and contemporary time. Spatial breaks disappear slowly. In the case of the synagogue, a reconstruction of an unbroken continuity seems to be more than problematic. Firstly, in a material sense, in contrast to the Frauenkirche, not even a ruin has remained. The building was skillfully pulled down, cut in small pieces and sold as roadwork, roadwork material. Secondly, the historical break seemed to be too deep to rebuild the good old times that we saw before, these good times which weren't good old times for specific parts of the society. This made it necessary to ask what is specific about the synagogue. It is difficult, if not impossible, to define a specific tradition of Jewish architecture which could have been used as a blueprint for the construction of a contemporary synagogue. Yet there is something um, highlighted during the 20s by Viennese art historian Max Eisler and recently by Salomon Korn. It is what one could refer to as the founding uh, architectural experiences in a way of the Jewish history, the temple and the tabernacle. The first religious building of the Jews was the tabernacle. We see a reconstruction in a way from the 19th century. Um, I quote, uh, a sanctuary they shall make so I can live in their midst. That is what was, that is what God had demanded of the children of Israel. Instead of idols, they should from then on honor an invisible God in a, in a provisional and portable building. The second building was, second building of God was a very stable stationary house, the Solomonic Temple. It is based on principle of permanence, structurally fixed with the Mount Zion having strong supports, as you see here, in a reconstruction by Fischer von Erlach from, 19, uh, from 1721. The synagogue, which in consequence to the destruction of the first temple, evolved as an institution during the Babylonian exile, can contain elements of the temple and of the tabernacle with a different accent. Put into general terms, according to the external conditions, the, uh, the synagogue moves back and forth between provisional and stable architectures. Until the end of the 18th century, synagogues in Germany are to be seen as more portable or provisional uh, buildings um, due to uh, quite unstable conditions. As permanent buildings, oppressing certain loyalty to a German fatherland, Jewish houses of worship emerge only with the evolving emancipation of the beginning of the 19th century. Here we see the building, uh, the synagogue by Gottfried Semper, built in 1845. And here we see like in, in many synagogues uh, that have been built in Germany in these times, uh, quite direct uh, relation to medieval architecture, which was uh, sort of neo-Romanesque uh, style, which was in these times uh, seen as, uh, as a sort of German style. In fact, um, this sort of emancipation ended um, with a disaster and to speak about German style is probably finished, hopefully, and this sort of uh, emancipation and then uh, 
seen as a sort of uh, German-Jewish uh, synthesis um, turned out to be in a sort of dead end. What does that mean for a, for a synagogue at the beginning of the 21st century? First of all, um, the site in Dresden has its own conditions. It is here we have uh, the historical, the most important historical monuments like God, the, the Semper Opera, the Zwinger, some churches, museum here, and the Brüche Terrace, and the synagogue here. So it's a very long and narrow site, which completely changed its its uh, its proportion in, in comparison to the pre-war status due to changements of the urban context uh, like a sort of motorway next to it and a very big uh, bridge here. So it, there, there's now we found a site that is extremely long and has had a very difficult slope in two directions and we developed the competition um, ignoring parts of the brief, two different volumes. One is the community center, the other one the synagogue with a public courtyard which opens to the Brugge Terrace. The, uh, the synagogue is related in a way to, to, the, uh, to the River Elbe and the community center is, works more like a sort of entrance situation to the historical city. This is the view from Bulcher Rasse, it's a drawing from the competition. And that is, was uh, in December last year. And you see that here in the community center again, this public uh, courtyard and the synagogue, which was developed in a with quite specific geometry because the whole side is a, is, a, is a rectangle, very narrow, and we turned in a way this uh, building or the volume of the synagogue towards eastern direction, which was also the direction of uh, the old Semper synagogue. So it was in this sense sort of literal orientation. Here we have again the, uh, the community center, which is uh, on three sides quite enclosed with the same material than the synagogue, but opens is opened to uh, the uh, to the courtyard with a quite um, generous uh, glass facade, gla gla uh, timber glass facade. The, uh, the elements that you can open is always sort of, uh, always these timber elements. So this is the uh, rotation to, towards eastern direction. It, is, um, it seems to be a very, or it is firstly a quite simple geometrical operation. Each layer remains orthogonal, so it's a, it's a rectangle in itself, but um, in using uh, different models, we uh, became aware that um, there are quite strange geometries uh, created by uh, this very simple operations. So, depending on the viewpoint, turning around the building, there are completely different perspectives. So sometimes it looks like a 
very simple simple cube. Sometimes it shifts towards uh, towards different uh, directions. So the elements of these layers, the material is, um, is a cast concrete. Each block has a volume of 120 to 60 to 60 centimeters. So it's a monolithic facade, has no insulation, has, uh, though it has a certain uh, heating system, sort of, uh, very basic uh, heating s first heating system uh, which creates temperature about uh, of about 12 degrees and then it is the temperature is uh, is in increased uh, to uh, approximately is 19 uh, degrees by a, by a heating system which is directly connected to the seats in the synagogue so it is a precast um, system. It's a quite industrial method in a way. Which afforded nonetheless a uh, quite long process of, of um, tests uh, in order to uh, to really understand what should be the texture of of these elements, these aggregates that that we used in the end is uh, is only a uh, sand in a way, like the typical sandstone that you find in in Dresden, and the uh, the surface is is quite rough in a way, and it's uh, so that in the end. Um, we had uh, a quite uh, good texture in, in the whole building. So here we see um, the different layers. The construction method was, though it looks quite quite complicated, this form was quite simple because each every layer is uh, completely completely straight and orthogonal. So it was just necessary to uh, to fix geomet geometrically an edge, and then uh, the workers could uh, build uh, one layer in a quite classical masonry technique with mortar and uh, two different types of mortar. And uh, but it it was quite easy in a way to control. Uh, the geometry. Here you see uh, the, uh, the whole geometry. These are only 35 layers, one above the other. And in a way, they, you, you saw these prefab elements, but they uh, they are based on, a, on the same geometry, but in, in their interior, there are sometimes uh, we needed some, some openings for uh, what well, was necessary to bring the water down and electricity up. So there, there was a quite complicated system in the interior so that we had to, um, to draw all these 35 layers, which we see here. But of course, they were drawn separately and then just shown here in order to control geometry. Here you see a part of this geometry. This is a detail of a corner of the synagogue where you have this can deliver in this direction, which turns in its logic here, where you have these steps. This is uh, a drawing of the edge with all the layers together. 
you see uh, the sort of radial geometry that you saw in the, in the slide before. So that was also something that uh, we only understood after a certain while how this really looks like. This is again an edge looking to the top of the building. This is also looking to the top of the building um, with an edge here and this is approaching the uh, the middle of center of the building, which is this geometry. That's where both logics meet in a way. And that's this situation where you see that when I said uh, it was uh, very easy to control geometry, it's not 100% perfect because then we should see here one line of these small shadows here, but that was something that we uh, uh, appreciated in a way that there, there is something like that looks like uh, made by uh, by man, and it's it's not just a geometrical uh, game in a way, but in uh, somehow the, the whole uh, volume is extremely precise, but you still see a sort of approximations to to this sort of ideal. Coming to the interior of the building, um, we see here the sort of poss is possibly a, you can turn around over the the, uh, the basic uh, space here with benches and the uh, al Memor and the uh, Torah shrine. And this interior is developed in a contrast to this very permanent and heavy material of the exterior. It is shaped by a textile. This is one of, this is the interior of the model that you can see in the exhibition. Um, these were f first approaches, in a way. No. <coughs> this is a situation where we, you have the, the Torah shrine and the textile and this uh, rotating structure that is uh, in the interior of the building the same as uh, in the exterior. And a very difficult process was um, the definition of this textile. We um, probably for two years we worked, um, as we uh, understood in the in the end, with the wrong company, and we uh, always talked to our client uh, about this material, but we couldn't really show it to him, and. After two years, we uh, we found something uh, a completely dif completely different material, which is still a um, metallic textile. But the problem was before that the uh, the textile was extremely rigid, and as people in the synagogue are very close to the textile, they they touch it and they. Uh, have a quite direct tactile approach to this material and that was the problem that we couldn't solve with the and the other company and with this contractor then um situation changed quite a lot because he's working more in the context of um well he's um fabricating clothes so he, he for instance he worked for Paco Rabanne in the 70s and 80s and it's a material that is quite smooth and that is really flexible in a way that can be deformed also in order to create different spatial uh, arrangements or conditions. It is actually a, a brass textile and 
of course the uh, this company they, they were really shocked when we uh, normally they uh, fabricate clothes we said we need uh, a clothes of uh, 800 square meters so it is suspended from the roof structure that you see here that's still in the, the working process sort of suspended like this the view above and that's this is the in interior of the synagogue it's very uh, um, basic and simple space so inside this, this textile structure uh, we, we found uh, sort of wooden furniture in different sizes, like the, this eastern uh, limitation of, of the space, the Torah shrine, then the al Memor, which is sort of reading place, and uh, benches here. This is uh, a view from the outside of this textile. So this textile is was quite important in beyond its um, material presence was quite important to react to uh, some uncertainties that. Uh, were given somehow by uh, the Jewish community here because um, it is an obvious problem that on normal days the, the community is quite restricted to sort of 30, 40 people. So it was necessary to create for this condition a quite intimate space. But on the important days of the, of the year, the religious year, um, they uh, get, get a real spatial problem. And in this case, uh, the, uh, the textile is wrapped in a way and opened, and uh, the whole space is f around this uh, inner space is filled with, uh, with chairs, etc. So it is used as, it, it has prob uh, certainly a, a conceptual relevance in, in this project, but it also has a quite immediate functional sense because it reacts to these different uh, spatial conditions and requirements that were given by by the, our client. The role of the architectural material is generally, a, um, for me, a quite important one. Material investigations start in a very early stage of the project. In this sense, the material gets um, nearly a sort of conceptual relevance. In the work for Video Videonale 9, a video festival of one week duration, we were interested in the conditions of the wall as such. Its role in the art, in the art system, the white cube system somehow, its closure and opening, its hierarchies. The location of the intervention is a former flower market hall, which had been transformed into an art museum by House Rooker and Co. in the beginnings of the 80s. They installed what they called uh, a flexible wall system, which uh, nonetheless never changed, never has changed uh, since the opening of the museum. The more people said, don't sh change this wall, the more the question of the wall conditions attracted our attention. The question was, 
can we develop a spatial organization which deals with alternative approaches to flexibility? What is the relation between walls and circulation? We started a material research which was guided by the aim of a quite homogeneous yet blurring wall condition and crucial for video works that uh, in the video um, a material we needed a material that um, has a sound absorbing quality so these were first uh, images that we created we made several tests with different soft materials textiles most you see some images which coincided, coincided uh, with a reading of Gottfried Zampers treatised style published in, 80, in 1860 where he develops a theory of clothing which relates the origin of architecture to textiles. According to, to his theory, the wall as the essential element of spatial demarcation can be traced back to felt robes, braided and twisted materials. The history of architecture could in this sense be read as a permanent exchange of material, as a story of increasing reinforcement of uh, robes and textiles. The spatial concept of the Videonade Oh, I think we have to change slides. The, co the spatial concept for Videonade attempts to exhibit the uh, ambivalent character of the wall as a border and threshold structured into 10 to 530 centimeters elements of industrial felt the wall sets spatial limits, yet it is open at the same time. The wide surfaces primarily create a large amount of spatial and acoustic autonomy, showing the videos as individual works. The textile elements are related to the irregular grid of supports in the form of flower market hall producing nine support-free spaces in various sizes, pure spaces where even doorways become oblivious. Besides the necessary amount of autonomy, the material elements create interferences between the individual spaces and works. So you see single flickers of light and acoustic sounds come through in this direction if you approach the, the, the felt structure. The border becomes unclear, it's blurring. The open wall allows one to walk through at any given point and produces a spatial continuity in between the works. Using the word open, I certainly don't refer to, to ideas of open systems that we uh, know from the 1960s. Our approach was more interested in physicality and if you want to talk about openness in terms of process and time, I think it is exactly a certain material determination of architectural decisions that allows openness and a certain variability of use. Like in this case, um, the work of the curator and the artist. So we developed only one element for this project, which is this wall, but the, uh, the exact configuration was done by the curator, and that's the drawing by the curator. And here, in the end, fixed the different compartments and the, the structure. 
so that is probably quite important um, to understand a certain role of, of an architect and because um, it seems to be quite difficult or rare to really uh, have sort of 100% control of everything what happens in the space and therefore one of the strategies that uh, we can use is a focus on on specific material elements and or on, on a material system that sets a certain, a certain determination of space but uh, allows other things to happen. As a final project on this evening I would like to show a quite, I could have shown a more complex um, big project but I would, would like to, uh, to end with a small project which might illustrate again this ambivalent role of the architect as, as I see it and this arch the architect is certainly somebody who deals with parameters but nonetheless um, speaking for myself uh, he's somebody who appreciates the uncertainties of, of the material. The project is a theater for Gießen University which is a typical 1970s uh, university complex pre everything in prefab concrete and the specific situation is this uh, major building here and a small forest in this area and the whole thing is a sort of interface between the city of Gießen and uh, the vegetation or, or land uh, around Gießen. When I speak about theater that's probably not the right word. It was important, an important part of our work to ask what this building should be something between theater and seminar sp space probably because it's a space for students something that allows different processes of artistic work guest professors like uh, Jean-Marie Straub and the choreographer Jérôme Bell or the director of this uh, institute uh, the composer Heiner Goebbels they all have different approaches in their use of space and in their work with students. Assuming that architecture is about spatial organization and determination, the question was how much architecture do you need? The location of the site was in this sense uh, quite interesting because it's the, uh, this architecture is extremely unspecific and it on major impact was this situation in between this building and this forest as you see here so there's a very straight uh, concrete facade and these pines on the other side the situation again coming back to the uh, to the question of determination we tested different types of theater techniques and their impact on performing possibilities and of course as uh, there are not a lot of technicians there it's, um, we had to take into account security issues for students in the beginning we started with a uh, surrounding structure which was this one it's a sort of sectional logic whole thing it's a sort of cage and um, but during the discussions we became aware of of a conflict 
structural devices became so important here in their physical and visual presence that performances were somehow limited and restricted. The walls lost in this option, the walls itself lost their physical presence as a material that has a specific uh, resonance that could also be used as a sort of basic uh, uh, background for a, for a stage. This was uh, a flexible ceiling structure which turned to be, a, to be a far too expensive and quite limiting in, in the procedure of performing or building up a uh, scenery. And we are now working on, on this model, which is basically a, a ceiling grid where we have a, added to this sort of punctual system of, of ropes, which is movable. So in this sense, it was a quite important uh, investigation for us to understand something about the question of foreground and background. So we started in a way with something like that and ended something with something quite calm in a way. And this, this was for us perhaps quite um, a very good critique in a way by, by our client, which is a very close relationship. The building is one space, so it has no <coughs> distinction between stage and spectators because it is uh, obviously uh, the context of a university work. So everything uh, is developed in a certain process uh, by a student's work, but which uh, in a certain rhythm of time uh, gets to a sort of peace in the end. Peripheric elements like storage and dressing room are integrated in boxes which can be moved according to the use of the space. The a major impact for us was in the discussions were the notions opening and closure, um, which were sort of key notions in this project. We had to we address different openings like one to the to the forest others allowing um, sort of summer workshop sort of extension to the building where we could use this as stage or as uh, a space for, for uh, spectators and the, with the inverse logic. So the, the idea of these openings were quite important uh, also for the as a part of students' work in an understanding of, theatric, of the theater conditions, the question of the black box in, in specific. The building addresses questions like hermetic conditions, relations to the context. So we have different openings that are integrating natural light, like this opening towards uh, the forest, which can be closed, of course. And this is um, a quite Im important point for us to, uh, to, re to re really reflect this, this idea of um, opening and closure without or hopefully avoiding uh, mistakes of being too literal. It's a certain danger. Um, the uh, research on the material here we saw again an uh, interior view with these conditions of either black box or uh, a situation where we have natural light. We're having an, a research on material reflection vagueness uh, regarding the exterior facade, um, developing different graduations uh, of surface depth, influence on weather, sort of 
starting a certain process of perception which changes to uh, according to uh, proximity and beyond that has a certain quality of tactility. This vagueness actually characterizes the research itself. I cert certainly know quite a lot of parameters of this theater that we are planning now at the moment, but the material question is still an open question and the uh, research is, uh, as you probably saw in most of the project, is, is a quite intense one, but it uh, very often creates a very open situation where, like here, the client starts to get nervous while I am appreciating this slow uh, process of making material decisions. These are probably, this sort of slow process in open situations, these are probably uh, the moments that I really like in architecture. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Before I forget it, uh, the AA has organized a visit to Berlin and Dresden to uh, see the synagogue. So uh, if anybody is interested in going, uh, I think there's some information available outside, or you can contact Mickey Hawks here at the AA, who uh, is, uh, is organizing that trip. Um, I know it's a little bit late, so maybe those of you who need to uh, leave could leave quickly, and then I'm sure uh, there are going to be lots of questions for Nicholas. Who would like to, uh, to start? Maybe while people are settling down, I can ask you, you um, specifically spoke about uh, the question of, of Jewish identity, and in some ways it seems that you are trying to situate uh, by talking about the Tabernacle and the Temple of Solomon, this idea of, the, of, the, of your project as something that really brings together the kind of instability of the permanent in mm -hmm. some way, maybe. Could you, uh, since there have been other projects, for example, by Daniel Liebskin, the Jewish Museum, can you situate your project in the context of another project like the, the, the Jewish Museum? How do you see the differences between your approach and what, uh, what uh, Danny has done in, uh, in Berlin? It's always, always a pleasure to compare uh, <coughs> own work with work of other architects. Um, <laughs> but um, let's put it like this. Um, I think Daniel Libeskind is probably uh, starting in his project when, when he devel developed the Jewish Museum. Uh, I think there was already a sort of language there. So, I think um, I, I would I would I would firstly ask uh, um, how specific is it to this uh, situation in Berlin? Even though I, I really appreciate appreciate this building, but I think it, there is a quite predominant uh, type of of architectural language which has its its qualities certainly, and I think the the material. Um, aspects of this building came quite late in the, in the project. So um, probably our approach is, is, uh, is closer to a, to a material idea just in the beginning of the project. And that's, as I see that, it's a different in, in, in the approach. More specifically about this question of Jewish identity, what do you, what is your, uh, what's your conclusion having done the project? <laughs> <laughs> These are the moments where I pre pretend, pretend to be, a, where I really uh, pretend to be an architect, and <laughs> of course, I think it's it's a quite difficult thing actually, because um, it. I became aware, probably also, um, why, because I'm 
very often here in London and I get aware of this sometimes very strange situation in, in, the, in the country where, where I live and work mostly. Because on one hand um, there is this very strange uh, relationship to, uh, to history and it's very strange discussions and uh, it's, it's really uh, difficult to follow and there are certain moments where you don't want to follow. But on the other hand, um, we have probably to admit that uh, one of the most uh, interesting projects in, in this country, in Germany, um, were about these issues. So also including uh, Peter Eisenman's uh, work in Berlin and, and others. So there seems to be something interesting in that. And perhaps these, these are these uh, sort of conflictual uh, sides and, and discussions about that. But to really define um, Jewish identity, I think it's not I'm not the right man to, to answer that. And I, I can only answer like that. It's, um, we, we lived, uh, nearly, nearly lived uh, four years with this client in Dresden and uh, perfect people, but I don't know if, if they are really Jewish. Uh, so, uh, so they have, most of them are firstly old, bloody old communists. So, <laughs> but very nice. <laughs> Any anybody else? Um, can you take the microphone? Um, I'd like to ask a question about the synagogue. Um, uh, as we, we, we spoke about this last week briefly, but um, the, the, the space which you didn't speak about was the external area in between the, um, the public um, meeting room and the synagogue. Mm. And there's certain aspects of the project which I'd, I'd like you to um, talk about, in particular the, the festive aspect of the Jewish calendar that you, you, you alluded to, the way in which the space inside the building changes. And I, I'm just wondering if there's some sense of time that relates to the outside space as well. I think the the, the outside space is um, probably less, I wouldn't say less important, but it has uh, another dimension because if you see uh, Jewish institutions in, in Germany, it's, it's mostly their bunkers, it's sort of highly protected uh, buildings and a uh, major um, work for us was, was really to um, to maintain this idea of a, of a public situation in between the two buildings so that was was a really important thing and beyond that it had certainly the importance to left this uh, formal space of the Semper Synagogue to, le to leave that empty. But the notion of time is probably not. Uh, it, it, it is a more. Um, it's more a notion of, of everyday, li everyday life, I think, because it's about the curiosity of the people coming there, and it's it's much more exposed you know, in this sense. It's it's. I think the. Uh, the decisions in, in this space in between w were quite pragmatic in a way. And the, the space obviously has, have the, has the functions to, to relate these, these two buildings, of course. I probably haven't answered your question, but that's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks. Can you please pass the Any um, significance to the geometry of the um, uh, the, the rotation? Is that, does it have significance beyond the uh, geometry, or you know, is there a religious angle to it, or can you say anything more about it? No, it's just architecture. It's, yeah. No, it's <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but. <laughs> 
No, it has, as I said uh, before, it has, uh, of course, it is an orientation as in a quite direct sense. But there is, beyond that, there is, uh, there, uh, I heard a lot of uh, explanations or things about symbols, etc., but uh, I, I never had that in, in mind. So, even though I like uh, different interpretations, certainly. But. Um, it's surely been pointed out to you, though, that to twist your block like that um, can't help but remind somebody who really knows Jewish iconography of the twisted column that always mm. represents the Temple of Solomon. But it's terribly subtle. It's only yeah. one twist. Yeah, I know that. but. <laughs> I heard that before, yeah, that's right. But I also heard sort of uh, heard a critic who was talking about uh, this sort of endlessness of of these columns uh, that we, we should uh, somehow uh, make a sort of eternal uh, shift, and according to these columns, but. That's uh, for me. It's interpretation. So I'm, I'm not, which which is correct. So p perhaps we uh, we did it uh, in subconsciously, probably. But but I heard I heard of this uh, idea after the the first block was set, was set. So <laughs> well, everything was too late to change. So. But throughout your work as a whole, it seems to me that uh, a kind of running theme mm. has been some sort of uh, uh, reciprocity or, or moving back and forth between opacity and, tran and transparency. Mm. And um, something to do with um, whether you can extend that phenomenon beyond the surface of the wall and into the depth of field of the space itself. And in the final uh, project, you seem to be uh, trying to, in some sense, make uh, the possibilities of a, a depth of surface extend into the depth of field. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I agree. <laughs> Does anybody else have any last words? Any of the students from the unit, former students, are they all hiding? What do you think about uh, this work now then? Do you agree? I mean, you've heard all the criticism too about your work, so do you have any? <laughs> Good. You guys hiding in the corner? <coughs> they will find a new unit. Well, <laughs> <laughs> right, well, thank you very much. Thanks for that.